hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com and Andre the Ferret running around. Um, my name is Jason Newland. This is relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety and panic attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Um, It might seem like I only make these recordings when Andre's running around. But I don't purposely do that. I am in the process of uh, trying to soundproof a... I don't know if you, if you don't know about this, it might make you laugh. I've got a garden shed in my bedroom. A garden shed. And I'm trying to convert it into a soundproofed recording studio and um, by recording I mean just somewhere where I can sit and record without the tiny pitter patter of baby Andre's feet and various other sounds in the background so there will come a time when Andre won't you won't hear him in the background so if you do like hearing him then make the most of it but uh, anyway, I've got this technique that might be useful for you. And this is basically a technique where you can change an emotion, change a feeling. So, for example, and I seem to keep falling back on the example of someone, you know, annoying you at work or, you know, someone, a friend or family saying something that's upsetting. But I guess I use my own examples of, you know, that's kind of things that might have bothered me in the past, something that someone said, because I can be quite, uh, yeah, quite oversensitive at times. And perhaps I shouldn't use the word oversensitive, but... I'm a sensitive soul. So here's something. There's a few different ways of uh, changing. Well, there's not a few. There are millions of different ways of changing how you feel. You can change it in the moment. Um, and by that, I mean, I suppose you, you could actually change it while it's happening. But that's a little bit harder. And I think sometimes it's useful to actually experience whatever emotions you're feeling it's healthy to be able to experience those feelings right just put, press pause there and put Andre in the bedroom <sighs> it was just non-stop so there's lots of different ways you can change it and as I was saying about the emotions I think it's okay to feel the emotions in fact it's possibly really healthy but not to hold on to it so noticing when something is triggering a feeling of uh, anxiety or stress or anger or whatever it is you know that's kind of healthy to notice it and you may some people might say of course I notice it but I think when it comes to stress levels, a lot of people won't notice it until it's really high, which is what happened to me. My stress levels were really high, but I didn't notice it because I was working in sales and you know I needed to be up, you know, I needed to be high energy and focused and I was drinking way, way too much coffee and also drinking alcohol in the evening as well So and not eating particularly healthily. I wasn't eating badly but I wasn't eating probably enough actually, enough like proper meals. And once I started getting ill, once I started having panic attacks it's all, I almost felt like my my stress 
ability or the ability to withhold stress or withstand it seem to have broke and I remember at the time you know back in 2003 2004 almost feeling that I'd had a layer of skin removed and I was extra sensitive extra sensitive um, not physical well actually physically as well to be fair but I was very jittery I'd walk down the street and I'd kind of if someone came too close to me I'd jump which is not my way and this is not how I normally would be and so it's very very kind of just that oversensitivity and again I'd, I'm always backtracking aren't I by using the word oversensitivity it's kind of a judgement isn't it and I talk about not judging myself and not judging ourselves so I was sensitive I was extremely sensitive and it seemed as if and I talked about the calluses you know on the hands of someone that plays a guitar and I've learnt the guitar in the past I wasn't a particularly good player but I did get calluses on the fingertips my fingertips and I played I was practicing and trying to learn it for I don't know probably three months four months and then I stopped and the calluses eventually just disappeared so my fingertips were sensitive again but during that time my fingertips were not sensitive I could push them against a hard edge and it wouldn't hurt you know it's tough tough skin now if I kind of get the I know it's just an analogy or a metaphor whatever you want to call it but I get the idea that I was kind of covered in calluses uh, maybe emotionally at that time before I had the, the, the big panic attack the first one that really sort of shook me and it seemed that every time I had another one and another one and another one that the calluses were just dropping off my skin to the point where see I didn't realise I, I thought of it as being like a really bad thing to have lost that de you know that desensitivity to stress seemed like a good thing but actually that's what that's what made me ill not being able to notice when I'd gone way beyond what was physically and emotionally healthy for me on the stress levels you know I'd gone way beyond it I was pushing myself I was doing really long days and of course I wasn't looking after myself either because I was drinking caffeine all day and then drinking alcohol all night so I wasn't looking after myself physically or emotionally mentally in any way really at that time I was rarely reading a book I'd watch telly and I'd just get drunk or I'd just drink and I used to pretend to myself that I wasn't getting drunk but the reality is I was I just didn't have anybody to tell me that I was acting silly or behaving, you know, behaving in a really bad manner because I was drinking on my own at home. So I didn't have any feedback from outside. You know, it was all kind of... I didn't have to face it, really. You know, I'd wake up the next day and I'd forget about the evening before. And what I noticed is that this is completely separate, but what I noticed is later on in life, I've seen films 
that I saw when I was drinking. And it's almost like I'd not seen them before. And I had a really large collection of films on um, video because that's all I did. It's basically, I just watched films, watched movies, watched telly, and that's kind of what I did for a couple of years. And drank, you know, drunk in the evening, and then worked six days a week. So it's almost like, you know, I got to the point where I was drinking so much that I was, although I was watching the film, I wasn't really taking it in. So I was even desensitising myself towards enjoying the movie. And at that time, I don't think I really enjoyed anything. The thrill of the chase, the thrill of the sale, maybe. But when I think about it in a different way, the desensitisation, uh, the or the the reverse of that, you know, the callus is falling off and then being really sensitive. It's almost, on a kind of a, a weird maybe way, being reborn. Because that's how a baby is when a baby's born. It's sensitive. It's got new skin, hasn't it? Everything's new. It's got sensitive skin. You can't... You have to check the bath water before you put the, the baby into the bath. Of course, part of that is because the child can't say to you, uh, the bath's a bit too hot. Although they will, they'll, they'll cry. But you have to, you know, you have to be really careful with a baby when it comes to those kinds of things and making sure that the you know, that they're comfortable and why wouldn't we give ourselves the same love and attention? And it dawned on me, probably around that time, maybe 2005, that perhaps, maybe 2004, that perhaps that was what I needed, that's how I needed to address it. Perhaps that would be useful to uh, look at it in that way, in the sense of um, that sensitivity is not a negative thing. It's a chance to rebuild. It's a chance for, in the sense of someone that has calluses on their hands, fingers, it's a chance for their fingers to heal. Because, you know, callus on a finger is almost like an injury really isn't it it's a continuous injury that continuously gets, keeps getting injured and then the skin grows over it so that you can no longer hurt your finger because if you kept doing it you'd end up with no fingertip so your body goes into action to protect you and even if it is just on the ends of your fingers your body knows what you, what you need. So it builds calluses, just like people that do bricklayers and builders and work, you know, work with their hands and they've perhaps got a tool that they hold regularly like a hammer or a screwdriver and they'll have calluses in the right positions for their hands so they can you know, use the, the tool without hurting themselves because they were continuously hurting themselves to start with and their body realised or their mind, their brain realised that that part of the body that part of the hand needed to be protected so a callus was created out of an injured part of the body the injury created a callus to protect that part of the body so to have that callus to have that to protect us from stress or from feeling the stress on one level you know it can be classed as a negative thing because it's it's stopping you from noticing what level you're getting to 
and it's so, so you don't get don't go don't go too far and end up having anxiety attacks and potentially you know losing your job or whatever because having a breakdown or whatever might occur if the stress levels aren't addressed but on the same side or on a different side whichever way you want to go your mind and your body is protecting you from that stress so it's kind of a, it's, it, from both angles your body is protecting you so it will give you that callus on your you know stress level so that you can handle the stress you can handle the situations to a point without it taking any notice of it and then your mind realizes that that's unhealthy you've gone past that level of healthiness and it stops you in order to help you which means if you look at it that way or it could mean I'm, 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 I'm open to what it could mean I'm just saying it could mean that your unconscious mind has allowed you to have anxiety or me to have anxiety attacks or high anxiety and stress to feel it in order to give us an opportunity to make changes or actually to force us to make changes And I don't know about anyone else listening to this, but when I first had the stress, anxiety, I mean, I don't know when I first had it because I had stress when I was, um, I suppose, all my life in a sense, but this was the worst of it, you know, the, when I was uh, in 2002, end of 2002, and the it forced me to make changes. But I ignored it to start with. I put it down to too much coffee. And just a blip. That's what I put it down to, a blip. It was at work. I just worked the longest week ever in that job. Just, you know, it's a, I've talked about this in the past, so it's in a previous recording. But it was, you know, my whole brain just... <laughs> just seemed to go into a meltdown I didn't know what the hell was happening I thought I thought I was dying that's what I thought to be honest that's what I thought and I spoke to a friend a very close friend at the time and I told her what happened because I hadn't told anyone I was a bit embarrassed because I, I didn't know how to explain it because I could not explain it to myself and even though I've been studying hypnosis since 1998, never come across anxiety as a subject or really took much notice of stress. Although I had done lots of relaxation exercises previous to getting the sales job, but not during the sales job which is a bit um, a weird one because when I first got into hypnosis the two things I realised straight away was the usefulness of hypnosis for pain relief and for reducing stress or f well, rather I would have worded it relaxation those were the two things that I realised hypnosis would be really really good for and um, I wanted to make a relaxation recording even back then. In fact, I did make some for myself. But, you know, this is before the... Well, it wasn't before the internet, but it was before the internet had the facility to put recordings on there. Like when the average person like me could 
put a recording for people to upload. Or if, um, if that was available, I didn't know how to do it anyway. At that time, there were no podcasts or anything. The name didn't even exist back then. So... I didn't do anything to help myself at the initial time when I had the panic attack in 2002 but I did um, I was very curious I sort of couldn't figure it out really couldn't figure it out so I just figured it must be just a blip but it's something that I couldn't I couldn't let go of. I couldn't forget it because I'd never experienced anything like it. Not like that. That was on a different level to anything I'd had before. And and then it happened again. I think probably about a week later at work. So I assumed it was a work related thing. So I, I had I didn't have any time off. I just left it, I carried on, and then it happened at home, and that was that was when I, I realised that, well, that's when I got scared, because I kind of, I suppose I did attribute it to stress levels in a way. You know, without going into it, without really sort of giving it much thought, rather just because I'd known that previously I'd been ill with stress, physically ill, never had anything on this level before. But I thought work related because, you know, I'm pushing myself too much. And I, I think I did start to slow down. I, you know, I started not going in as, as early doing less hours, just doing like the normal hours, no extra hours, no overtime. But then when I had it at home, and I, I went to the hospital, uh, to the a and emergency ward, and got tested, you know, and they said, oh, you're fine. And that was a horrible experience because, not, not the way I was treated, because I was treated wonderfully by everyone there but the fact that I went in there and I was seen pretty much straight away because I was you know because of my heart I thought it was I thought it was a heart attack that's what I thought and I told them that I was having palpitations and like a weird sensation in my chest which I was and they saw me straight away pretty much and there was a lot of people there waiting and probably been waiting there for hours. So I felt guilty. And I felt embarrassed because when I left, I think I, yeah, I think I walked back through there and I just didn't want to look at anyone. Because they, they tested me, you know, gave me all the standard tests, heart monitor, you know, blood pressure, nothing wrong with you, it must be stress, it must be an anxiety attack, that's when they first said it, the word anxiety attack to me, I just, yeah, it just come to me now, and they said, uh, go and see your doctor, which is what I did, I went and saw the doctor, and the thing is, after that it happened again, I thought, no, I'm not going to go and see a doctor. And I went back to work, and it was and it was happening at work. That you know, the following week, and I went up to my boss, my my supervisor, and I, I took him to one side and I said, "Look, I've really been feeling ill. Really had these weird feelings, and it, and it's it's like the old joke, isn't it? I felt like I was trying to show a dog a card trick." It was his expression of complete, um, a mixture of 
disinterest and I don't know I feel almost like I was telling him that the bus driver farted on the way to work it was almost that kind of, although I probably would have got more interest from him it just was not interested um, but I think it was maybe he just didn't relate I didn't really have like a connection with him as a person just a lot younger than me and I don't know it was just I don't know what it was but he was like completely not interested so I went back to work just went back and got did me thing and then uh, I think the next day I went to the doctor's first thing in the morning and I got signed off for a week or two the doctor signed me off gave me beta blockers which did not help at all. So I know they apparently they're really good for some people. They just didn't didn't do it for me. And um, and it just just got worse from there. So I won't go into more detail. I've talked about this before, but it just it kind of rolled over from there. But over the years, I've learned lots of different techniques that can help to reduce the feeling of stress or the feeling that could lead to stress so you know uh, or just the feeling of stress itself within you and as I said there's millions there's unlimited amounts of techniques that could be used that have not even been created yet that would be just uh, another creative extension of something that's already been used which is basically what creativity is isn't it it's just putting things together and kind of coming up with something new sometimes so this is one particular technique and I realise that I've been talking about sensitivity and calluses and I quite like the idea of the newborn bit the opportunity to I know it's not literally being newborn and I'm not talking about it in a religious way but in a an opportunity to do something different an opportunity to move away from what was towards kind of where you want to be and at the same time using the space of where you are now as a bridge to get there because you know this moment is the bridge to the future always isn't it and we create the bridge as we walk along we're literally creating the road just before each step we take it's a little bit do you remember Michael Jackson's video? Was it Beat It? Um, when he steps on the steps and they light up. So it's almost like every step you take, that step, that uh, part of the pathway lights up because that's where you are now. It's the only part that you are in. It's the only place that you are now. The very kind of mindfulness um, meditation walking meditation you're like that's where you are your left foot in front of your right foot this is where I am now so the opportunity to I guess be reborn is in every second isn't it in every day so we don't have to wait till there's enough money in the bank or until a certain thing happens to make changes and you, see, you could say well I can't I can't afford to buy that new house for 10 years I'm not talking about I'm not saying you could go out and buy a new house tomorrow I'm not talking about it in that way but you can make changes towards that goal 
if that's one of your goals you want. But you know, that's that's this podcast isn't really about um, achieving financial wealth, financial wealth, as opposed to other kinds of wealth. But it is part of it is getting in touch with the fact that you choose what you do next. We all do. We choose what we do next. And I won't go into that, but I will do another time. But I have gone very deep into that um, idea in the past, in previous recordings. You do. You choose what you do next. I need to find it so I can title it. So here's a technique, and I've done this technique with people in person. So this isn't just one of my many um, ideas maybe that I've just recorded and let it flow, let it fly away and be used and hope for the best. Although it is still part of that process, but I've used this technique, not just with others, but with myself. And it can be used on lots of different things, but we can focus on stress, uh, a feeling of stress that you may have in your body because it generally it, it presents itself in your body somewhere. Now, I understand and I realize that your stress levels will very likely reduce quite a bit when you listen to me. Just for the maybe during because of my boring voice or uh, maybe if you listen regularly you'll connect these recordings and my voice with a sense of comfort and relaxation safety hopefully and know that you don't have to do anything you don't have to say anything you don't have to be anything you know, you just be yourself and nothing's expected of you when you listen to these recordings. And it's quite, I think it'd be quite a nice feeling. And that you, you can listen to something, you can listen to me and I'm quite, I don't know if the word is prolific, but regular. Quite regular in the sense of I make quite a few recordings. Um, throughout, well, not just throughout the year, but throughout you know the week, and I make these generally daily or every couple of days. And so you get different perspectives. You get to look at things in different ways, and I think that's really healthy. I find it's really, really good for myself to do that which is part of the reason why I listen to talk radio a fair bit because I get to listen to people's discussions who have totally different opinions and it's, I think it's fascinating seeing the dynamics and the thought processes of course I can't I don't know what the thought process is, is but you can kind of get an idea by the way the person's talking and the way they're trying to explain themselves and yeah so I like the idea of looking at things even you know, I don't have to agree with somebody to actually get something from what they've said even people that say horrible things it's I find it interesting to sort of like what how did they come up with that where did they come up with that anger, with that? That's just, how? <laughs> how did someone get themselves into such a, uh, a negative mental state to have so much hatred towards a group of people? Well, you know, that kind of thought process. And it does fascinate me. So, you got the feeling in your body 
So I'd like you to focus, if you want to, I'd like you to focus on whatever stress level you're at now, which probably won't be particularly high, but just notice anything that's there and search for it. Search for it, look for it. And it, you know, generally it presents itself physically. So it could be in your lower back, could be in your stomach, could be in your chest, in your throat, in your jaw, your shoulders, hands, your eyes, your forehead. You know, it could present itself as uh, your eyes being strained or like a, a mild headache. Or I mean, it's unlikely you're going to have that if you're laying there or sitting there with your eyes closed for the last 36 minutes you probably I hopefully you'll be quite relaxed but nevertheless if you're up for it maybe focus on your body and just notice any part of your body that feels the part that feels the most unrelaxed let's say anywhere that maybe you generally hold stress because we all have stress. Nobody is completely stress-free. Uh, we need a degree of stress in our bodies in order to function, you know, in order for us to move around and for the muscles to work and all that stuff. To have alertness. If we were completely, totally relaxed the whole time, um, we possibly wouldn't be able to get out of bed. We'd just be floppy, like a like a blancmange or a jellyfish. So it's a bit weird. A jellyfish in a bed. That'd be a strange one. So I don't need to focus on that part. And all you do is just focus on it. when you focus on it something happens because it starts first of all you notice it's changing it does not stay the same and that feeling tends to move it tends to move around so it might start in your stomach but then as you focus on it and you give it the spotlight that perhaps it wants, which is why it's trying to get your attention. It wants the spotlight, it just wants your attention. And once you give it your attention, like a little baby that's crying, sometimes you don't need to do anything, you just gotta go in, pick your baby up, and then the baby's happy again because the baby's got your attention but the baby will possibly cry and cry and cry and cry until it gets your attention. Which can also all, almost be like how the stress is. It's almost yelling and crying to get your attention. But it doesn't want anything, it just wants your attention. It just wants to be acknowledged. It just wants, maybe it could be, <laughs> you know, it might sound weird, but Maybe just wants your love, just wants to be recognized, wants to be included, you know, doesn't want to be ignored. Being ignored can be quite horrible for, for people. So why would it be any different for our feelings, our own feelings? So you give it attention, you put the spotlight on it and you give it attention. And not only does it kind of reduce, the level reduces, but it changes, it moves. And sometimes it might move into your leg, or it might move into your hand. And then you just follow it to wherever it's going. Follow it to where it is now. And you put that spotlight on it again. Maybe you can say hi. You're giving it attention. 
you're not ignoring it, you're not pushing it away, you're not trying to hold on to it, you're accepting it. And then it, maybe it moves to another part of your body and you can put the spotlight on that part of the body. By the way, this is, <laughs> this is in your mind, you're not actually, you don't need an actual spotlight to sort of be moving around your body because that would be way too much effort. As you focus on it, maybe it moves down to your feet or moves into your hands. And the whole time, there's no part of you that's trying to get rid of it. You're not trying to reduce it. You're just, you're just giving it attention. That's all you're doing, giving it attention. Just giving it attention. Just shining that, shining that light on it. And notice where else it moves to. And as it moves around, it reduces. Naturally, it seems to. And it, it, that seems to happen every time. And it's, it stopped crying. Because that little baby is no longer anxious or stressed or angry or confused or whatever the emotion a baby's got going on. There may be a mixture of emotions. But once the baby, your baby sees your face, maybe you don't have to hold the baby, maybe just say, hello little Jason. You could go as far as to actually name it little you, mini me, you know, because it is you, it's you, it's inside you, these feelings are you, these emotions are you, they belong to you, they're not alien, they don't belong to anyone else, they're just feelings. Once you kind of give it a little bit of a, a bit, a bit of attention, a little bit of, you know, just putting a spotlight on it. So hello, mini me. You right? It stops crying. It stops crying. The emotions calm down. And you can follow it around. You can. You know, follow it around different parts. Or you can just say, well, I'm happy with how it feels now. It stopped crying. It's not giving me, doesn't really need attention at the moment. So, and you can just leave it alone. And then just be in there to pay attention whenever you have those feelings again. And sitting with it. And just saying, hi, mini me. I'm here. Until that part of you stops crying. So I'm gonna leave you on that. It's just an idea, you can play around with it or not. It's totally up to you. So I'm gonna leave you and I'm gonna to speak to you very soon. Thank you for listening. Remember, you know what I'm going to say next if you listen regularly? Remember, remember, remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. And this means actually doing something nice for yourself today. Or if you're listening to this late at night, do something nice for yourself tomorrow. Give yourself a little treat. Something where you feel it gives you a lift, an emotional lift. Thank you for listening. Lots of love.
Bye.